Let's pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to God's word that comes to us from John 15, verse 1 and verses 4 to 5a. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I always enjoy going away on vacation in the summertime, but what I often come back to is not all that enjoyable. Vines. Vines, vines, everywhere vines that have taken over our garden, that have taken over our trees and our bushes, that have taken over our very lives. We definitely need a full-time gardener just to keep our habitat manageable. While Jesus is making reference to a more favorable vine, one that produces fruit, the imagery still is powerful and one that we can wrap our minds around, so to speak. He is the vine, the source of life. His father is the gardener. We are to be connected, branches with, which bear fruit. Anyone who knows anything about plants knows that when branches disconnect from the life source, they're as good as dead. And anyone who knows anything about vines, weeds or fruit bearing, know that branches cannot be left to fend for themselves any more than branches can bear decent fruit without the ongoing attention of the gardener. The agrarian people to whom Jesus is speaking could also understand this I am statement of his. For centuries, the Jewish people understood themselves to be God's vineyard, with God as the gardener. Isaiah 5 is called the song of the vineyard, in which God sings about his love and his attentive care for his people. In this I am statement, Jesus is adding another dimension to that imagery. He is declaring that he is the one who can provide his followers an ongoing intimate connection that we need and that God desires. Once again, Jesus is taking a familiar image of God and his relationship with his people and then making it even more personal. If we want to live the abundant life that Jesus came to provide us, we need to be connected, intimately connected to him, period. Jesus says, apart from him, we can do nothing, nothing, not even produce fruit. We are the branches, not the vine. We are also not the gardener, the father has that necessary job. And yet, how often do we try to go it alone or think that we can tend to the garden of our lives without ongoing prayer, without reading God's word, without a regular, daily connection with the divine lover of our souls? Down through the ages, humans have tried to live their lives apart from God, always to their detriment. Jesus understands this human inclination, and he knows the reality that just like branches on the vines, if we are left to our own devices, little good results. Branches, if left alone, as you've seen, can grow uncontrollable, becoming entangled and attaching themselves to other things, sometimes to the point of killing them. Jesus lets us know that it doesn't have to be that way, as he provides this loving reminder of God's desire to be intimately involved in our lives. He knows that we need an attentive gardener who knows all about us, who knows weeds from fruit, who knows when to prune and when to harvest. He knows, that he knows his Father wants to lovingly sustain us and do what is necessary to promote greater well-being and growth in our lives, in our families, in our ministries, in our churches like the Good Shepherd. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the gate or the door to an eternal relationship with God. He is the vine 
and the Father is the gardener. I don't know if you've noticed, but the triune God has the tough jobs in this relationship. Our call is to abide, to remain, to follow, to stay connected to the source of our very lives. As we continue our summer sermon series on worshiping God and God's revealing character through Jesus' I Am statements, I also want us to look at Psalm 145. However, I'm going to do something a little different today and just highlight some aspects of this song. At some point in your day, I encourage you to take your Bible and highlight for yourself the attributes of God that resonate with you. Psalm 145 is unique in that it is specifically designated as a praise song. It's the only one out of all 150 song, psalms that is a praise song specifically. In Hebrew, the language which this psalm was originally written is a poem. And each verse, each half verse, and each section begins with successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. As one writer has noted, the poet praises God with everything from A to Z. His praise is all-inclusive. More than that, the entire alphabet, the source of all worlds, words, is marshaled praise of God. One cannot actually use all the words in a language, but using the alphabet, one uses all potential words. If ever we are at a loss for telling God how great he is, all we need to do is sing, shout, pray, or meditate on this song. Or we can try to compose our own using every letter of the English alphabet. Psalms of praise and worship, whether our own or those that were written thousands of years ago, help us to remember that we are the branches, not the source of all good things. They also remind us that the divine gardener really does pay attention to us, really does care about us, and really does want the best for our lives. One of our confessions, the Westminster Confession, asks the eternal question, why are we here? What is the chief purpose for us to be here on earth? The answer to the question is an amazing one. Our chief purpose, our chief end, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Our reason for being on this earth is to praise Him, to honor Him with our very lives, and to enjoy Him, to enjoy His company. We are to enjoy God, enjoy God today, tomorrow, and all the tomorrows that God graciously provides. And Psalm 145 provides a road map, if you will, about how to go about it. You see, the psalmist couldn't help but worship and praise God as he loudly acknowledges God's character and all that God has done, was doing, and promised to do in the future. Before COVID-19 invaded our lives, we as a church family were beginning to intentionally look for glimpses of God in our ordinary lives. We were also being encouraged to share those God sightings with others. The psalmist does just that, and he encourages his listeners to do the same. And they have. The Jewish people, down through the ages, have used these words to worship God because they know that God delights in being worshiped for who he is as well as for what he has done. C.S. Lewis, in his Reflections on the Psalms, wrote that it is in the process of being worshipped that God communicates his presence to us. Think about that for a moment. As we worship God, he lets us know that he's here. In the process of praising God and all his goodness, God reveals himself to us in ways that we cannot experience otherwise. So as we sing or pray or proclaim what we know about God, as we enjoy God, as we worship and praise God, we can get to know God even better. 
He is in our midst, and he wants to show us even more who he is and who he wants to be in our lives. Pretty cool, huh? So we're going to take some time with a few of the declarations of this psalm so that we can abide, so that we can worship God. And I encourage you, as we spend time pondering a few of these psalms of amazing, amazing truths, that you thank God for who he is and how he is revealing himself to you, to us, to the world, right now. You ready? Listen to God's word that is taken from the message translation. God is magnificent. His greatness knows no boundaries. In fact, it could fill a book. He acts with marvelous might. His beauty and splendor have everyone talking. He is famous for his goodness. His righteousness is known and talked about. He is all mercy and grace. In fact, everything he does is suffused with grace. In other words, he is gracious in everything he does. He is not quick to anger. He is rich in love. He is good to one and all. His kingdom is glorious, lavish, full of splendor. His kingdom uses his power for good. His kingdom is eternal. He always does what he says. He gives a hand to those down on their luck. He gives a fresh start to those who are ready to quit. He provides what is needed on time. He is generous to a fault. He lavishes his favor on everyone. Everything he does is right. Love is the trademark on all his works. He is here listening as we pray. He does what's best for those who love him. He hears us call out. He saves us. He sticks by all who love him. As Jesus said, you abide in me, and I will abide in you. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. It's no wonder that the psalmist needed to use every letter in his alphabet to worship God. It's no wonder the psalmist says that God can never be praised enough. It's no wonder the psalmist sings that he will lift praises to God and bless his name, bless his character, bless his attributes, every day from now and into eternity. It's no wonder the psalmist proclaims that all creation and all creatures applaud God. No wonder his mouth 
is filled with God's praise. No wonder he encourages that every living thing bless God's holy name from now into eternity. It's no wonder, because apart from God, we can do nothing. But when we abide in him, he, the divine gardener and lover of our soul, will abide in us and with us, and we will bear much fruit as we glorify him and enjoy him forever. Woohoo! And amen. So, who are you going to tell this amazingly good news today? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let us declare what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, strive to serve Christ in your daily tasks, living holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.